in order to accept what's called the linear no threshold hypothesis for radiation effect on living things, you have to accept also the belief that nature is stupid. Over billions of years, we have evolved immune systems because everything in nature lives in a chemical environment and in a radiological environment. 700,000 years ago, there was twice as much U-235 and so forth. So we have organisms that can survive in a thousand times more radiation than a human can. Well, why is that? Right? Where, would, where did those bacteria live that would let them develop this kind of a, an immunity to radiation in particular? Uh, earlier than, than uh, we ever had uh, oxygen to breathe, cells had to evolve to handle uh, attacks from chemistry like, uh, like the sulfur chemistry that originally was involved in life. If you go back three and a half billion years to the sandstones of Australia, you can find organisms that lived then before there was oxygen in the air. So at that time, they had sulfur chemistry to deal with, which is actually easier to deal with than oxygen. Then we evolved uh, strains of bacteria and, uh, and then eventually plankton that photosynthesized produced oxygen. And at about 1.6 billion years ago, there was enough oxygen in the air uh, to dissolve in the sea and so forth so that we could evolve oxygen breathing uh, organisms that would metabolize, get their energy from burning carbohydrates in their, in their cells. So that's where we are now. But oxygen is an extremely dangerous element to life because it oxidizes carbon and hydrogen very actively. So obviously cells had to develop a way of protecting themselves themselves from the unavoidable damage that was being caused by living in a, an environment with oxygen, with some radiation, and so forth. So that's exactly what has happened. Cells have a, an ability to repair the broken bonds in DNA. They have the ability to perhaps repair some protein damage. Uh, they have the ability to digest the junk that's produced by damage. And they have the ability to actually eat themselves and kill themselves. So cells can actually die intentionally because they've become so screwed up inside because of various forms of chemical or radiological damage. And that's actually what happens when you have radiation poisoning is you've killed cells, typically in the intestinal tract first, that are, are very uh, susceptible and not, not able to handle that amount of radiation. So here's a, just a chart from Wikipedia about the metabolism in all our cells it has exogenous damage from the outside world, radiation, chemistry, and so forth. It has endogenous damage from inside itself because it does metabolism. It burns, it burns its fuel internally for energy. And the most damaging things are oxidants, hydroxyl radicals, uh, alcohol, that, those kind of chemicals that have a lot of oxygen available to corrode the insides of a cell. The reality is that over a few billion years, Mother Nature figured out how to deal with this. And so every cell, every second, every cell in our body does a repair of some sort, a DNA repair in particular, in, in case of a break in a DNA strand. Each of us has 10 trillion cells. You have to eat to support the metabolism that does that repair. If we do something to the cells, expose them to some damaging source that is doing the damage faster than that, whether it's chemical or radiological, we're getting in trouble. We're not going to be able to survive. Over here, if, if Weinberg and if Nixon had, in the 70s had not put all the money behind the fast breeder reactor, this curve would be down here, the peak would have been here, and it would be much easier to meet this requirement. If we only want to have 160 million people out of land or out of food, then we needed to be on one of these lines and reducing CO2 emissions. Well, we haven't. Today we are going up, we're on the red curve for sure. Who knows if we can meet what the red curve says, 9% a year reduction. Doubt it. It means that everybody has to consume less than 100 gallons of gasoline a year 
per capita all over the world for everything. That means flying on the plane here, driving your car at home, heating your house, all, that, all the electricity you use, running your PCs and your eye gadgets. That has to add up to less than 100 gallons of gas per year. This is how fast we're doing temperature rise on Earth. This is the fastest rise that occurred in the sediment records going back 56 million years. So we're doing 100 times what Mother Nature, working hard as she could, did 56 million years ago to raise the temperature of the Earth by, by CO2 content. Uh, this is our actual ice loss in the Arctic. This was the projections from the different organizations. And here's Greenland disappearing in 2008. 50 cubic miles of, of ice. This is the reality that unfortunately is motivating what we're doing. This is the most serious problem. The pH of the seawater average around the world. In the North Atlantic, the pH is even lower than that. And we're already seeing deformities in animals that form the base of the food chain. What we see here are calcified shells and calc calcifications of bony structures, skeletons. And if we, and that's where the carbon gets stored. It sinks to the ground when they, uh, to the bottom of the floor of the sea when they die, and that's where limestone comes from. So that's the carbon sink that if we lower the pH, we stop that. Now, so we stop not only the food for all the ocean's animals, except for those guys who are still living down there near the thermal vents and using sulfur chemistry, we stop all the food in the sea and 20% of human food protein comes from the sea. So how, that's not 160 million people that would be affected. That's billions. Where these two lines cross, the red and the blue, that's not 2050, that's 2030 if we're lucky. So we don't have any time to worry about global warming. We don't have any time to worry about sea rise. We need to figure out how to raise the pH of 98% of all the water on Earth by 0.1 in a few years. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Even thorium can't do that. That is the problem. Uh, there was just recently a couple of articles about how this is the worst pH, ocean pH in 300 million years. So that's the real problem. Okay, so back to some hopeful stuff. <laughs> Here's a gold atom. Just to give a scale of reality, if we have a gold atom that's two feet across, we blow it up, the outer electron will be about 3.3 miles away. So the size of an atom, if you look at an atom from outside that's outer electron and you look back, toward the center, sort of like looking at a, at a dandelion seed puff, looking from the outside in. Something that's two feet in diameter, 3.3 miles away, you can't see it. The, atom, the, the idea here is to explain how small the nucleus of an atom is compared to an atom itself. Doing it another way is if we were to take the solar, the sun, and shrink it, from 900,000 miles to two feet, Pluto would move in. The Kuiper belt, where, Kuiper belt where all the rocks that form comets and things like that would shrink, would move in. <clears throat> it would have to be multiplied by two to be as big as an atom. So an atom is actually twice as big as the solar system at the same scale. And if you were in the solar system and you were on the outside, outside of the Kuiper belt or outside of the Oort cloud, where all the little, real little junk that's left over from the solar formation is, you look back and you could see that there was a star there. But you really, there would be a background of other stars that are pretty bright too. So you wouldn't be sure that that's your sun. That's how far back. So you could see it because it's making light. You couldn't see the nucleus of an atom if you're outside it's electron cloud. Okay, so this is, this is a scale thing. So the question is, if we're gonna split this atom, how can we do it? We had to hit it with a neutron. How are you gonna hit it something you can't even see from outside the atom? Well, fortunately, there's what's called a strong nuclear force, and that provides us with the ability 
to make an atom, it also provides us with the ability to think of an atom as, 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 as Velcro covered. Every neutron and proton you can think of as has covered with Velcro, and if you get them close enough together, which is the problem with fusion, where you're taking two positively charged protons, trying to squish them together, fighting the strongest force in the universe, the electromagnetic force, trying to get them together, and as soon as the Velcro grabs, now you can let go, thank God. But you worked really hard, and then <clears throat> the Velcro grabs. Well, it's actually a little better, too, for, for us to split an atom because this, the Velcro that's holding all these guys together is actually hairy, sticks out pretty far. It sticks out far in relation to the size of the nucleus. And the neutron that you're trying to hit the nucleus with looks like it has Velcro that's pretty hairy. So you don't have to get the neutron exactly at the center of the atom. It will actually go by it and get grabbed if it's not going too fast. And that's where actually the neutron spectrum that we talk about, thermal spectrum being relatively slow, easy to grab, has a big cross section. The atom looks, the nucleus looks like it's big because it's got this hairy Velcro sticking out and the neutron has the Velcro and it gets grabbed. But if the neutron's going too fast, then the Velcro doesn't necessarily have a chance to grab it. So the cross-section for fission, or just capture, goes down rapidly as the neutron velocity goes up. Okay, so I just wanted to go th through that to get some scale involved in what we're talking about. Now, where does radiation come from? Well, here's, this li here's all the stable elements in that band. The red dots indicate where there's, where there's a, actually an element that is more or less stable. Notice that there are some elements that uh, some elements that have no stability. So technetium is one, uh, promethium is another one. There's no way in which the neutrons and protons can be combined in a nucleus there that will stay together. They just kind of, they're vibrating around, they're unhappy about their condition, and bingo, they're going to do something. So they can emit, if you want to uh, make an element that's unstable be stable, you can move it down this way into, into the... Uh, St stable region. Uh, alpha decay does that by moving two positions, getting rid of two protons, two neutrons, moves you horizontally that way. Beta decay or beta, beta plus decay moves you diagonally, so you can change a no neutron into a proton or a proton into a neutron. And then there's another way you can, ch you can have an electron inside. The closest electron to the nucleus can be captured by a proton, and that gives you a neutron. So that reduces your count of protons by one increases the count of neutrons by one. So the whole thing about atom elements that are stable is that they have a ratio of neutrons to protons that makes them happy. Everybody who's got the Velcro on them is happy, happily in their state. Uh, and, and they'll stay together. Too many neutrons, they'll become unstable. Too few neutrons, they become unstable. So down here at hydrogen, we have one proton. We can add a neutron to hydrogen, make deuterium, and it'll be stable. That's fine. But there's no way of making stable atoms where there's an equal number of neutrons and protons beyond that, uh, beyond that in helium. When we fission an atom, we get a bunch of smaller atoms. Uh, it's like a Chinese menu. There's, t there's two columns in the menu, and there's about 20 possible atoms that can be the fission products. Those guys started out up on the curve that I showed you, uh, uranium, or thorium, uh, uranium or plutonium. And if they come down at a 45 degree angle, because you cut them in half, about some neutrons were uh, left, then you're going to have an unstable atom. It's got to get rid of neutrons. So that's why everything's, pretty much everything's radioactive after you split it, an atom like uranium. And this, this just shows a typical chain. So here we were emitting electrons, which get rid of neutrons, because we have too many neutrons after we split the atom uh, that we started with. And so we got to get rid of those neutrons and convert them to protons and then move down the curve into the stability region. So that's where the radiation is actually coming from. So we're coming from fission product radiation. We're getting electrons, beta particles or electrons, and we move quickly down to stability. So here's 
or not so quickly, depends on the half-life, right? But usually fission products have a relatively short half-life because they're very unhappy in having so many neutrons. So an alpha particle is just a helium nucleus, moves us down two protons, two neutrons. That gets us down to towards stability pretty quickly. Uh, beta particle is just an electron that's emitted, or beta plus is a positron that's emitted. So you can go either way, getting rid of a neutron or getting rid of a proton with the beta plus or beta minus. And a gamma ray is an electromagnetic radiation when something is happening in the nucleus, in particular, to rearrange what the, how the nucleons are, t are stuck together based upon what has happened with, uh, with the, the previous event. An electron capture, for instance, which gets rid of a proton, turns it to a neutron. The nucleus that results is now kind of unhappy about its exact arrangement, has to rearrange itself for stability. It'll emit a gamma ray. The electron that gets sucked in for electron capture gets sucked in quickly enough so that it actually emits an X-ray. So there can be two different spikes of radiation uh, that way. Natural radiation is in our bodies all the time because we, we eat. Potassium-40 is a low content of natural potassium, but it's radioactive and it's within our bodies. We have about 4,400 decays per second within our body of potassium-40. So our bodies are busy Radio, being radioactive. In 1946, Herman Muller got a Nobel, Nobel Prize for his work with radiation and, and other things on, on genetic mutations. And in his prize, Nobel acceptance speech, he basically said that there's a linear relationship between radiation dose and the problems that it causes for the organism. But his data didn't actually support that. So this was an interview done with someone who knew about that from years later in the IEEE spectrum a little while ago. And his, basically, his data didn't say that. And the people who worked for him disagreed with what he said in his Nobel expect, acceptance speech. However, the problem was that the, the National Academy of Sciences took his words. And that's the beginning of where the standard for linear no threshold dose, in other words, no dose is too small not to cause trouble. And we know that that's not true from actual measurements. This is another example of a radiation lie from England. Christopher Busby was a doctor who said that there was leukemia in kids in Wales being caused by a nuclear reactor there. Well, it turned out he had fibbed. When they did the analysis of his data, he had done things like counting the incidence of leukemia twice. He had mixed up figures from small and rural areas, creating clusters of leukemia that didn't exist. And in fact, when they looked at the actual leukemia cases in one particular region, instead of having uh, 10 cases, there was one. 